Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian Joseph. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm the Vice President for Programs here at the National Endowment for Democracy. As a colleague of mine noted the other day, the level of repression and the scale of human rights violations in China today are of an entirely different magnitude. To think about it simply in traditional human rights terms can appear as if we are missing the broader picture, the planned systematic destruction of entire societies. No longer can we talk about rights violations in a compartmentalized manner. Until the last few years, the human rights discourse in China focused on specific rights, language, religion, speech, association, ethnicity. As we will hear from our three distinguished Democracy Award winners today, there is an urgency to the challenges to their communities, which will require us to consider how we engage in the struggle to advance freedom in China. You have all of their bios, but because they are the Democracy Award winners, and that's why we're here today, please allow me to read a little, a little more about each of them. Bob Fu is a leading voice for persecuted communities in China. Born and raised in China, Bob was a student leader during the Tiananmen Square demonstrations in 1989. He was also a Christian house church leader in Beijing until he and his wife were imprisoned for two months for illegal evangelism in 1996. Bob and Heidi fled to the United States in 1997 and founded China Aid in 2002 to bring international attention to China's gross human rights violations and to promote religious freedom and the rule of law in China. Bob regularly briefs and advises governments about religious freedom and human rights and has testified before congressional and parliamentary committees in the US and Europe as well as international human rights bodies, including the UN Commission on Human Rights. Dolkin Issa, to my left, began his work as an activist as a student leader at Xinjiang University. After leading pro-democracy student demonstrations in 1988, he was dismissed from university and endured years of persecution before fleeing China in 1994 and seeking asylum in Europe. In 1996, Dolkin established the World Uyghur Youth Congress and in 2004, helped co-found the World Uyghur Congress. Dolkin was elected w World Uyghur Congress President in 2017, has advocated on Uyghur human rights issues before the UN Human Rights Council, European Parliament, European governments, and international human rights organizations. He has mobilized the Uyghur diaspora community to advocate for their own rights and for the rights of Uyghurs in East Turkestan. Dolkin's family that remains in East Turkestan continues to suffer greatly. He recently confirmed that his 78-year-old mother died in a Chinese internment camp last year. He has been unable to locate or contact his 90-year-old father. Ladan Tetong is co-founder and director of the Tibet Action Institute, where she leads a team of technologists and human rights advocates in developing and advancing open source communication technologies, nonviolent strategies, and innovative training programs for Tibetans and others facing heavy repression. A visionary strategist who has spent two decades building a powerful nonviolent movement for Tibet's freedom, she pre previously served as executive director of Students for Free Tibet, where she led the high-profile global campaign to condemn China's rule in Tibet in the lead-up to and during the 2008 Olympic Games. Ladan made her international headlines as she posted real-time accounts of her travels through Beijing on her blog, excuse me, one of the first in the Tibetan world before being detained and deported. Laden was awarded the first ever James Lawson Award for Nonviolent Achievement in 2011 and currently serves as co chair of the International Tibet Network, the global coalition of Tibet related non governmental organizations. Um, for t this afternoon's conversation, it's going to be a conversation, will take about 45 minutes, and if there's time, we will open the floor for questions and answers. Um, but let me start by sort of ask, asking each of you if you can just give us a brief introduction to yourselves. We have your bio and what you've accomplished, but I think it'd be interesting for the, the audience to understand a little bit about what motivated your engagement. Was there a seminal moment or an incident or event or something in your lives that sort of forced you into this line of work? Do you want to start, Bob? OK. Thank you, Ryan, for your introduction. Um, thank you for your kind um, leadership. Um, I really um, I'm feel very privileged and honored uh, to be here, especially with our uh, two other leaders of the Tibetan and Uyghur communities. And thank you, Ambassador Brownback and uh, Dr. Carl Gershon, for your leadership uh, in all these years um, in supporting and uh, providing um, the unwavering uh, kind of uh, uh, principled leadership uh, for the freedom cause. 
Uh, China Aid uh, was funded uh, in 2002 uh, when I was uh, studying in Philadelphia. Uh, actually, like uh, five, three, four, five years uh, after we were accepted as refugees into the U.S. Uh, from China. Um, the really motivation for us is to uh, be a voice for those uh, voiceless, uh, faithful, um, uh, persecuted community communities, and especially those who are persecuted in the underground church and uh, uh, both Protestant and Catholics. As we know, um, you know, when I, my wife and I kind of um, came back every day and um, seeing uh, our uh, children are able to sleep peacefully without needing to worry about their parents being taken away uh, for their uh, leadership in a Bible study or, or, you know, without being afraid of their parents being put in a torture chamber. Um, living in the free society, uh, we feel, I mean, at least we have freedom of speech. <coughs> we can uh, be a voice for them. Um, so that's the, the main mission of China Aid is to advance religious freedom for all and uh, rule of law in China by exposing these uh, abuses of persecution by encouraging these abused and uh, by equipping the leaders uh, among the grassroots. Yeah. Thank you. Levin? Yes, thank you uh, very much for to National Endowment for Democracy for this incredible honor and this opportunity to speak uh, for the Tibetan issue and also uh, to Ambassador Brownback for your uh, support for the Tibetan struggle and for the clarity with which you present the situation uh, inside Tibet, uh, in China and East Turkestan, um, and the importance that this moment uh, for all of us, uh, how important it is now that we get it right in terms of changing the course. Um, personally, so I was, uh, to answer your question, I was born into the <coughs> Tibet movement, into the resistance. Uh, my father's Tibetan. My mother is Canadian, and they spent the early years of their marriage and their life together in India working uh, on the refugee crisis to, in the early days, in the 60s and the 70s, as Tibetans were just fighting to stay alive um, and to survive and uh, reestablish some kind of uh, community and normalcy in India. And my parents were part of setting up the uh, agricultural settlements in South India where Tibetans turned the jungle into farmland and battled uh, a very different climate and disease and the early days um, many Tibetans died it was really the the most difficult days of the struggle and I grew up hearing those stories uh, my parents <coughs> moved to Canada in the 70s and I grew up traveling with them as they we're both trying to seek humanitarian assistance to get Tibetan student sponsorships so they could survive and thrive and in exile uh, in India and Nepal. And then also, um, you know, the His Holiness, the Dalai Lama Tibetan issue in those days was not widely known. And so the few Tibetans, the handful of Tibetans that were living in exile around the world, um, like my parents, uh, my father, and uh, with the leadership of His Holiness, really built the political support that we now have today. And that was um, the really grassroots efforts that I, I was part of from being a child, you know, in a stroller outside the Chinese consulate for protests on March 10th, Tibetan National Uprising Day. And eventually I got the opportunity to serve and to work. Um, at university, I had a chapter of students for a free Tibet. And I had the opportunity to come to New York and to work for 10 years with Students for a Free Tibet and to get training and empowerment and you know the grassroots experience of doing the, the work at the, at the, you know, in the trenches of the movement to try to shine the light inside Tibet, to try to support all of um, the initiatives and the um, follow the leadership of His Holiness to, to provide some protection or some uh, support for Tibetans inside who were carrying out the freedom struggle in the darkest and most difficult times. Uh, and the Olympics campaign was, I think, the major 
turning point for many of us, but also just a moment where we, we realized we could insert Tibet and human rights into the story that China did not want uh, to happen at that moment and to, and to make sure that Tibet was not forgotten and that China's narrative on Tibet, that Tibetans were happy and prospering under Chinese rule, that that would not succeed. Great, thank you. Dogen. <coughs> thank you. I would like to also thank uh, National Endowment for Democracy, President Carl Gresham, and organize this wonderful event. And uh, you turn your mic on. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. Well, thank you, uh, National Endowment for Democracy, mm -hmm. and the President uh, Carl Greshman organized this wonderful event. And also, I thank uh, Ambassador Brandbeck. Uh, he really supports Uyghur cause since the many uh, years, particularly since the, uh, after the concentration camp issue coming internationally. So, uh, World Uyghur Congress is umbrella organization and the united voice of the Uyghur people in the exile. And this is the umbrella and the uh, representative organization. It was formed 2004 in Germany, based in Munich, in Germany. World Uyghur Congress, uh, we are mostly uh, working, uh, educating the Uyghur right to the international, particularly United Nations Human Rights Council, European institution, European Parliament, and the national government, national parliament, and the also closely cooperate with uh, international <coughs> human rights organization as well. Uh, as you know, and just uh, uh, since, uh, since the recently years, Uyghur cause was not well known cause. M most of some people didn't know the Uyghurs. Uh, Tibet cause is very famous, everyone knows, but Uyghur cause uh, was the very well, uh, less known the cause. So that's why uh, World Uyghur Congress, uh, we are trying to uh, bring to the Uyghur issue. Uh, to the internationally and uh, uh, takes international attention because Uyghur problem is a Tibetan problem is completely same problem. Uh, but s there are several reasons Uyghur uh, issue is not well known. That's why World Uyghur Congress uh, want to uh, take this mission uh, and bring this cause to the internationally. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, job and advocacy work around the world. Uh, yeah, and uh, my personally already, Ryan already introduced to me, I was born in Turkestan and I escaped my country in 1994. Uh, since uh, since uh, t 25 years, I'm living in exile. Since then, I have never been to the, my hometown. Since then, I have never seen my parents, brothers and sisters, my friends. Uh, well, and uh, s uh, s since the 1997, Chinese government put my name in the Interpol red notes, I was suffering 21 years as a terrorist and the red notes by the Interpol. Uh, but I have never uh, disappointed with this. I uh, had continued fighting for my right, and uh, I got a lot of international support. Finally, 2018, last year, my red notes was, was delayed. No, uh, my name not anymore in the uh, Interpol red notes. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, 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 one thing I would like to uh, mention, I would like to take your attention. Today is last day of the uh, Holy Ramadan. More than one and a half billion Muslim people f peacefully fasting for the one month, but exception Uyghurs, Kazakh in East Turkestan. And the whole the <coughs> Holy uh, Ramadan month, uh, Chinese government forbidden fasting. Ambassador Brambeck already mentioned even no, you cannot give the name Muhammad Aisha Samet such a name to your baby today, you know, no any religious freedom. So uh, this, this year, particularly 2019, Ramadan month, very critical, very uh, miserable month for the Uyghur people. And tomorrow is uh, Ramadan Bayram, Ramadan festival. Uh, more than one and, bil uh, one and a half billion Muslims celebrate this uh, Ramadan uh, festival, but Uyghur is accept exception. We cannot celebrate it. And the whole, so there is a lot of, I see a lot of my countrymen, they want to call parents, friends, and uh, family member to say hello and celebrate by, and, uh, Ramadan festival. My personally too, 
I wanted to call my parents, 90 years old par uh, father, my mother already died in the camp, but if he's still alive, I have no idea. I want to uh, celebrate his festival, my brother's sister's festival, but I cannot. I cannot. It is very uh, unique. A whole Uyghur community living in Europe, United States, around the world. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to turn the conversation a little bit towards the question of identity. So there's a lot of discussion and knowledge about political repression, surveillance, all of the different uh, tools that the Chinese state uses to control the population, the entire population. But your three communities have distinct challenges and threats they face. And I, the way I understand it, core to it is sort of the broad concept of identity, whether it's religious identity, the language you speak, the religious practices, core tenets of what makes your communities, your broader communities, or in the case of the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, your very sort of specific communities is the idea of identity. So I'd be curious if each of you can talk a little bit about what it means to your, to your community that the, the level of oppression, the scaling <coughs> of the repression in the case of, uh, as you noted uh, in Xinjiang, which I think the statistics are actually over 3 million people out of a population between 10 and 20 million people who are facing direct threats. Can you talk a little bit about identity and how that motivates your work? Sure. Uh, as you said, today is estimated 3 million Uyghurs uh, in so 21st century concentration camps. They are suffering. Some say 2 million and some resources 3 million. But we don't know exact number. Maybe some say more than 3 million. So today is Chinese government really uh, start uh, and the, uh, and, uh, and ethnic cleansing policy uh, towards the Uyghur. Today, Uyghur identity is at risk. And the Chinese government's uh, one policy has never changed. It is assimilation policy towards the Uyghur and the Tibetan. Chinese government uh, implemented this policy sometimes used very violent way, sometimes with some mm -hmm. mask. Particularly Xi Jinping talks of power 2013, we have witnessed and they really start to very clearly even ignore all international uh, 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 warning, just very clearly implemented ethnic cleansing policy today is in, in, in East Turkestan. You know, and I, I can say some example. Language, religious, and the cultural is most important factor of the uh, one uh, identity. And uh, Islam, and the Uyghur language and the Uyghur culture is the most important uh, factor of the ident Uyghur identity. Today, Chinese government continually targeting this Uyghur language. When I was studying Xinjiang University, Uyghur language is, we, I teach, I learned the Uyghur language. But start 2004, Chinese government, so-called bilingual education system, actually it is Mandarin education system, stopped the Uyghur, uh, 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 Uyghur language at school. But step by step, from 2006, then from kindergarten to the university, all the Chinese language education system. Then 2017, Chinese government's official, made all official announcement, saying just, just throughout bilingual education system, so Chinese language, Mandarin education system. Today, Uyghur students, school children, cannot speak each other during the break time at school. And uh, le uh, uh, religious, it is one of the important factors of the Uyghur identity. We already uh, talked a little bit. And it, since 2016, 2017, within one year, more than three to five thousand Uyghur mosques a, a mosque in East Turkestan destroyed completely. No? Today you cannot go to the mosque. You cannot pray. And so many mosques destroyed, so many mo mosques is already banned. You know? All the mosque is empty. And the, and the uh, country. Just I give you some example. Kashkar is one of the ancient city of the secret. Yeah. More than 2,000 years history. 2008, 2009, Chinese government start so-called new host reform policy and they destroy whole the cultural heritage. More than 75, 80% cultural heritage control destroyed. Then 2017, World Uyghur Congress with campaign to save the Kashgar cultural heritage. Then European Parliament, 2012, Past the origin, the resolution asks Chinese government stop the destroy the Kashgar cultural heritage. But that time is already 75, 80 percent all the uh, cultural her heritage is destroyed. So today, Chinese government really uh, implemented 
and the uh, cultural uh, eradicated all, all the Uyghur identity. Thank you. Alden? Yeah, so the, it's clear the Chinese government is hell-bent on destroying, uh, eliminating Tibetan identity. Um, because this distinct identity this is, is a threat to the Chinese state. They see it as a threat that Tibetan cultural, uh, religious, linguistic, national uh, uh, existence, really they, they, they will not have the loyalty. They do not have the loyalty of the Tibetan people. The loyalty of the Tibetan people is first and foremost. <laughs> Uh, to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and to Buddhism or to their, you know, their faith. And um, this was made clear in 2008 when Tibetans all across all th the three historical provinces of Tibet uh, <coughs> rose up in March 2008 at the moment the Chinese government least wanted any sign of instability or dissent um, in protest against Chinese rule and against these uh, practices that are crushing Tibetanness, the the repression of religion and language and culture and social relationships and and traditions, uh, the forced settlement of millions of Tibetan nomads, then and the, essentially they're trying to end the nomadic way of life on the Tibetan plateau, and so uh, for Tibetans, you know there has been the the exile, the political movement, the support for Tibet, the leadership of His Holiness has provided some protection and some, <coughs> uh, in some ways mitigated the way that the Chinese government has acted in Tibet for all of these years. Though the situation is terrible, there's been that um, uh, light shining from outside that's made it difficult for them just to do whatever they want, I would say in some ways like what is happening in, in East Turkestan. And so uh, now what we see, I'll just give an example of language. So um, in Eastern Tibet, in the traditional Tibetan province of Amdo and in part of Kham, which is mostly in Qinghai, um, the, the Chinese government, the provincial authorities 10 years ago tried to do this language reform policy where they were gonna switch the medium, medium of instruction for primary and middle school to Chinese. And Tibetan, thousands of Tibetan students across this region rose up and protested. And they challenged the authorities on this. And, and being so soon after 2008, the, the authorities did back down. They didn't want this kind of trouble or the escalation of these protests. And so with support from outside and Tibetans and student, students and, and teachers protesting inside and ex-government officials, um, bringing forth petitions, they were able to, f the, the authorities backed off and said, uh, we will do this w later when conditions are better. Well, now here we are, news has just come out of one area of Eastern Tibet that they are planning to do this this fall, that they're, um, they're gonna change the medium of instruction. And that all of these Tibetan school children <coughs> will suddenly have to learn in Chinese. And what this means, I think, it's hard to just grasp for us who've never faced such a, an issue, but for, I was just speaking with a Tibetan friend here, and she was talking about when these policies were implemented uh, when she was a young girl in Lhasa, a school child just entering middle school. And she said she went from being the top student in math to being, to failing. And this was the story for all of her peers and people she's met here now this whole generation of Tibetans, the immediate impact is that their studies were completely disrupted. Their futures were impacted because of their achievement in then high school and their ability to get into good universities or um, their future careers. Everything was impacted. That generation had such a hard time. Not to mention that what the Chinese government knows they're doing is taking, trying to disconnect a people from their own, the children from their own culture, from their parents, from their mother tongue, from their ability to achieve. And so um, I think, you know, in the, there's a young, so there have been 155 self-immolations in Tibet, at least to date. Um, these only started in 2009, really in 2012. And uh, one of the young, I have the words of one of the young Tibetan 18-year-old uh, boy who uh, self-immolated because of, 
you know, his wa wanting to protest China's occupation and the cultural genocide that's taking place. And I think in his words, we can understand best how this feels, this, this, the religious repression, the repression of Tibetan identity and the language. He says, at the time he said he, he, he did die as a result of the protest in February 2012. He said, raise your head high. These were his final words. Raise your head high with courage and loyalty. I, Nungdol, call with gratitude upon my parents, siblings, and relatives. The time has come for me to leave for the sake of the Tibetan people by lighting my life on fire. My requests to Tibetans are be united, be Tibetan, dress Tibetan, speak Tibetan. Never forget that you are Tibetan. Be compassionate. Respect your parents. Most of all, be united. Treat animals with compassion. Do not slaughter them. Long live His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Long live all the lamas and tulkus of the land of snow. May Tibetan people be free from China's oppressive rule. There is immense suffering under China's rule, and this suffering is unbearable. I think that's one of the most clear expressions of what this means to people, to an 18-year-old boy. Absolutely. Mm. Bob? Yeah, in, in terms of the uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party's um, religious policy toward the um, Protestant and the Catholic communities, uh, since these two communities, uh, have, you know, does not I mean, do not necessarily affiliate it with one, you know, uh, ethnic group. Um, um, so the religious policies are always designed uh, for uh, absolute control, if not absolute destruction. Uh, especially, you know, under uh, President Xi Jinping's regime, uh, this this uh, slogan uh, called "sinicization," uh, which really, uh, in essence, uh, means uh, falsification. I mean, "zhongjiao uh, zhongguohua" is "zhongjiao fascistishua." It means basically, um, if uh, the church or um, both personnel or doctrine, uh, if it's not under the CCP's absolute control, then I mean that if you don't follow the party's words or to <coughs> follow the party's uh, path called Qingdanghua uh, Gandangzhou. So this, this uh, slogan, like, follow the words of the party and walk uh, with the party, is uh, put uh, uh, as posters everywhere in, in, in the churches, <coughs> uh, both uh, the Protestant uh, and uh, Catholic churches. And then you're facing destruction. I mean, uh, so under President Xi's regime, uh, I mean, the, the, the administration, uh, since he took power, the first experiment he had happening in Xinjiang. I mean, immediately, unprecedentedly, um, that uh, the even the government sanctioned, you know, registered, supposedly legally kind of protected churches were targeted. Within uh, a, a year or so, uh, at least over 17 to 1800 uh, church crosses were being demolished, demolished, destroyed and taken down, and many even churches were being uh, totally uh, destroyed. And, and uh, after that experiment uh, was uh, deemed as successful, and then the campaign started all over China. And for the first time since the Cultural Revolution uh, that uh, the Chinese regime uh, would uh, force the religious believers, uh, certainly you know, to the Christian community, uh, to sign a form to renounce their faith, and no children, um, and, uh, in, uh, and including other professions like uh, the medical professionals, like doctors, nurses, and teachers, um, educators, uh, and uh, anybody under 18 years old, is none of them is even allowed to have any religious identity, uh, especially in those. Uh, uh, Christian populated areas, uh, the ch children <coughs> were uh, forced to sign a form to renounce their faith. And even the CCP is trying to change your faith. Of course, the doctrine, the Communist Party's religious doctrine, uh, policy <coughs> doctrine, is to make religion compatible with the communism and <coughs> socialism. 
So they want to change your doctrine. I mean, we have instances showing the uh, Xi Jinping sent religious affairs inspectors going different churches, mosques, and uh, even Buddhist temples, try to examine and change your doctrine. So in one instance, we, we, we already documented that uh, a religious affairs inspector would change the Ten Commandments to none by removing, removing the first uh, commandment. <laughs> and uh, now there's a five-year uh, retranslation of the Bible plan to um, make the Bible the scripture uh, compatible with socialism. Uh, so this is an a ongoing campaign. And also the torture of believers uh, shows a very uh, kind of a destructive uh, force uh, in, the in the name of national security. Mm -hmm. And you have, uh, as uh, Ambassador Brombeck just mentioned, the early Iran Covenant Church, which is still under enormous uh, kind of a pers uh, amount of persecution in the past uh, year, or, or uh, less than a year since the December the 9th, when more than 300 believers were arrested in that church alone, we recently learned at least uh, 80 of them, 80 members uh, from like uh, three years old uh, uh, to uh, 70 years old, um, uh, at least uh, 80 of them suffered uh, torture in order to extract confession, false confession against their church leader, uh, Pastor Wang Yi and his wife, in order to build a case for uh, so-called inciting the subversion of state power. Um, so we documented uh, last year alone, in 2018, uh, with uh, um, all uh, uh, the credible information, uh, at least uh, uh, over 50,000 these believers were being tortured and abused. Um, so this is a, a really a major <coughs> campaign uh, for, um, if not absolute control, then for absolute destruction. Great. We only have time for one, <coughs> one last round of questions. And I wanted to ask each of you to sort of, if you can offer some, some guidance or advice for the international community, but also for Chinese citizens, not obviously the, the Chinese Communist Party, but Chinese citizens, <coughs> about what, what you would like to see them, the international community do, what actions they should take. Is there a role, or how would you mobilize that role for Chinese <coughs> citizens? But I would also, I know time is short, I think it's important for each of you to the degree it affects your community to, to talk a little bit about how dangerous or is it dangerous for those in exile, yourself, the, the repression, the, the f blowback on your families and friends inside China. Is there, are there things along those lines where your activism, your speaking out has a ramification for your friends, family back in the country? And if so, what, what should we be doing to highlight that aspect of your advocacy? Do you want to start first, Madon? <coughs> oh, sure. Okay, um, mix it up. And answer both questions now? Uh, you can take either. We only have seven okay. minutes. Okay. So, so maybe I'll just go, right, I'll go straight to uh, what we would hope in this moment as we are 30 years on from Tiananmen Square massacre and that moment that we believe was so alive with hope and possibility. Um, mm -hmm. Now we we need to recalibrate, and it's it's time for the international community and especially policymakers and opinion leaders really to think about how we've turned uh, to China's language, and we've sort of changed all the rules to adapt to what the Chinese government wants and what they want us to say and how important language is. And so this is just one part for us. We'll be asking. Um, the you know government leaders to reconsider or stop saying at every possible turn that Tibet is a part of China. Tibet is a part of China. That this undercuts the Tibetan position, the compromised position of the middle way policy that the Dalai Lama, um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, came up with that the Tibetan government in exile is um, forwarding, and that the world and world leaders support that to say that over and over again is exactly what China wants. And it's not helpful to the position of the Tibetan government and of His Holiness to say that and to give them what they want. And uh, the, in the position should itself should be re-examined. What should the position of the US government and governments around the world be on this, the status of uh, Tibet? 
and to look at that in the light of international law and history. And so that is one key thing. And then I think, it just furthermore, going on language, um, 2008, so many people describe it as journalists and policymakers, everybody, in China's terms, as a violent riot or riots. There were, in March and April alone, I think international campaign to, for Tibet's numbers, 125 protests across all three historical provinces of Tibet. Uh, outside, not just in the t t what China calls Tibet, the Tibetan Autonomous Region, but in Qinghai, Gansu, Sichuan, Yunnan, the areas that have, of Tibet that have been absorbed into <coughs> China. And the, of those 125 protests, tens of thousands of t Tibetans participated in the protest. The vast majority, the overwhelming majority, were nonviolent. And the handful, say 14, that turned violent, the majority of them were property destruction or targeted at the, at the Chinese state. So to call 2008 a violent riot on the behalf of Tibetans is just, I think, not just factually incorrect, but it's wrong. And it, it does exactly the wrong thing in terms of reinforcing China's messaging and framing of the issue. Um, and then Tibetan places, when you're when, when we are talking about Tibet, Tibet exists, Tibetans have names for all of these places that even China recognizes as Tibetan. All of the autonomous pre Tibetan autonomous prefectures in those Chinese provinces. <coughs> and to call those places by the Tibetan names, or at least to call them by both names, or put the Chinese name in brackets, or a slash, something that just doesn't hand over these important historical, geographical <laughs> truths to China. It's not that's not a neutral thing to do, and the Tibet-China conflict should be more evenly treated by the international community. It shouldn't just be on China's terms, and clearly doing everything on China's terms has not gotten us where we want to be today. So this should be reconsidered uh, in all of this. Language matters. The Chinese government knows language matters. The weaponization of history is critical to them, and we're seeing that play out all over the world. It threatens all of our security. The Tibetans deserve at least as much the reconsideration of this language. Great. Bob, do you want? Yeah, um, <coughs> I want to really turn attention on an, uh, another issue of, uh, um, I think, really the Communist Party care the most uh, is the internet freedom. I think uh, why, you know, a, 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 a guy called Zhang Haithao in Xinjiang, you know, was sentenced to 19 years old for like tweeting, forwarding uh, 274 uh, messages uh, through Weibo and, uh, and Twitter, 19 years. I think the communist regime is very, very afraid of uh, the, uh, the freedom to connect, the, the, fr uh, the information freedom, the, the truth uh, that really, uh, that uh, contrary to their uh, uh, regimes of the built by lies. And the Communist Party, one leader even said that, he said, if our party cannot traverse the hurdle represented by the internet, it cannot traverse the hurdle of remaining in power for the long term. Uh, so, I mean, so this is uh, the kind of um, the the one uh, particular issue, I think, uh, th that uh, um, the internet ability to undermine their survival, and therefore the, the Chinese regime provide unlimited resources to maintain internet firewalls. I mean, this is really the brain walls of our time. So unfortunately, I think uh, our US Agency for Global Media um, which is the successor of uh, the BBG, the uh, Board of uh, Broadcasters uh, uh, Agency. Um, I mean, um, will they, they, they had uh, only divert less than 1% of the budget among their over $700 million each year for internet freedom. And I think that is a, hu a huge mistake. And I, I hope, of course, the, I mean, the, 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 the U.S. Uh, um, uh, AGMs, uh, the kind of uh, 
self-interested uh, disregard of the internet power to fulfill the 21st century mission is very inexcusable. So I would uh, really call the BBG uh, or, or USAID and the internet uh, uh, freedom um, uh, anti-censorship budget to really at least to kind of uh, increase to 10 percent. I think uh, that you know, uh, because the technology is already ready and it is mature and it doesn't need to really increase the taxpayers, uh, you know, money uh, to accomplish. So we established a coalition from both right and left, you know, working along with the, the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, I mean the Tom Lantos Human Rights uh, and the Justice Foundation. And uh, we call on Congress really to establish a primary uh, U.S. AGM's obligation to rapidly provide access to the internet in closed societies, or at least to compel the U.S. AGM to allocate, you know, uh, the not less than 10 percent of its corporation. And uh, the world will be freer and safer the day after 200,000 Iranians are able to conduct an interactive town hall meetings and half a million house church Christians <coughs> are able to participate in a US based you know worship services online uh, the same will be true when Chinese crackdowns in Tibet and in Xinjiang can be immediately known to the world and in China so the <coughs> time has come I think uh, I would urge a, a policy uh, kind of a very uh, small fine tune uh, that will make the difference. Um, I right. um, remember uh, last year when uh, Senator Jane <coughs> Lanford and, and I conducted an online kind of uh, meeting with uh, five house church leaders in five different provinces with one available internet firewall circumvention software. And uh, without any detection, we conducted over an hour. Um, you know, how about expand it, you know, to a million, you know, five million, and to not only the, the ethnic uh, Han Chinese, but in Xinjiang, Tibet, and uh, Iran, North <coughs> Korea. So that's my point. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, today is 21st century, we all know, and uh, but uh, more than three million people uh, in the concentration camp. After the Second World War, whole the world have very good, uh, very bad uh, experience, saying never again. But it is happening again in Turkestan. But China, in this century, continually denied and hiding the reality, saying, no, we don't have a camps. We have a, a training uh, camp or vocational camp, something like. And uh, today, so many things was, was uh, going on. Maybe so many deaths was uh, happening in the camps. but. Actually, reality, a lot of evidence we don't know. So uh, most of some countries continue the silence today. You know, so many uh, orphanages. More than 100 or 500,000 Uyghur detainers already transferred to the Chinese province. What for reason? Was it all the capacity uh, of the camps? This reason or for the organ harvesting? For the 500,000 Uyghur, for the use of Hong Kong possibility. We don't know. And uh, uh, such a horrible things was going on. Uh, and also Chinese government not only persecuted to the Uyghurs inside the camp, on the inside East Turkestan, but also and the call to the Uyghur activists in outside, in abroad, to push the silence. If you speak up, then your family member will be dangerous again. So that's why uh, most of some Uyghur who live in uh, United States, Germany, Europe, around the world, uh, have the same uh, problem today, face the same problem. So in this situation, but unfortunately today is around the world more than 200 countries, but among them very few of them, like United States, Canada, European country, speak out. But most of them country continue silent, particularly Muslim country particularly Muslim country. Only Turkey speak out, and as the United Nations 40 section of Human Rights Councils speak out this. Rest of some all the Muslim countries not only silence, even support Chinese policy towards the Uyghurs. 
repression policy. It is a really shame, 21st century. No. And uh, uh, so, and today is also a lot of uh, foreign company continue doing business with China. Even some company, United States, Germany, some other European country, also and uh, investi investing and also uh, helps uh, uh, provides uh, surveillance technology. This should be stopped. And the uh, U.S. government and uh, some other country, a democratic country at least, should be comp uh, and uh, takes uh, concrete actions. Yes, recently, yes, recently, most really international media attention to this cause. And the United States um, Vice President Pence and the Pompeo Foreign Ministry all speak out. We are very happy for this. But just concerning the issue not good enough because China never stopped, continue expanding, continue uh, uh, arrested people, denied people, kill the people. So someone should say stop it. It is the time to stop. And the other things, and uh, this year is not only 30 years anniversary of the Tiananmen massacre, but also 5th of July is 10 years anniversary of the Urumqi massacre. Already 10 years passed. But we don't know exactly how many people were killed, how many people were injured. Still, a couple of thousand Uyghurs still missing. So the world should be asked the Chinese government. takes the responsibility. And I would like to mention here, use this opportunity to the Chinese friends. 30 years ago, Chinese democratic movement start Beijing. All the Uyghur students support this democratic movement. Stop teaching and strike and they went to the street and support the democratic movement. Today, more than three million people in the camp. We see very less support for the Chinese people. Of course, some Chinese democratic society outside the country speak up, but not good enough. Even some students who study in Germany, Europe, uh, Europe Xi Jinping visit just uh, uh, last month, visit Europe. That time, so many Chinese students who study Europe support Chinese Xi Jinping, make demonstration against us and welcome Xi Jinping. You are, okay, is Chinese civilian in brainwashing, they cannot speak up in China. But they are enjoying democracy. Your study is a, is a democratic country. You should not support the dictator. You know, you should, you should wake up and at least uh, uh, Chinese civilian people and stand up with us. This is the only way to stop this persecution. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, well, please join me in. I guess you just did a round of applause for our <laughs> three <laughs> democracy award winners. <laughs> <laughs>